Thank you. Buenos dias. Hello. Uh, it's, it's really great to be here. Yeah, I think we're going to have a, a really excellent conference, tons of great speakers, um, and really excited to, to open things up for you guys. So uh, I wanted to talk to you about doing user research and doing it really quickly, uh, being efficient, and getting creative, uh, or enabling your creativity and, and spurring innovation. Uh, but before I do, I want to talk a little bit about like where this talk came from. Because it the, the roots of it happened many years ago when I was living in Washington, DC. Oops. Playing with my clicker here. Okay. Uh, don't want to get ahead of myself. So Washington, DC, this was my home. Um, this was during the, the massive snowstorm called the Snowpocalypse or Snowmageddon. And, uh, and I was clearing out snow from, from my pathway there. And I, I remember this because I was working with a client at the time. I was working at an agency doing website design and research. And we were working for a theater company. I did performances and they were going through a website redesign and um, a redesign of all their collateral. And I was responsible for doing the user research and do, do, doing the design. Uh, and so we were looking at their homepage. We were talking to a variety of people, we talking to donors, people who were um, giving money to the theater, volunteers who were helping out, run the theater, and of course, um, educators um, who were there and um, helping to educate their students on what the theater was doing. Anyway, so we did lots of work. We interviewed people. We did usability testing. And we learned a lot of great things. A lot of great things that we put into 25 pages of analysis. This was like quotes, usability findings, competitive reviews, heuristic analyses, all these great research activities. So we had a lot of recommendations. And like if we looked at all of them in aggregate, there's this large circle. And let's just think about like that's everything that we wanted to do. Here's all the awesome things that we want to do for this theater company. We had uh, a talk with the client, we sat him down, had a workshop, went through all 25 pages of our analysis. They said, yo, there's some great stuff in here. Some things, uh, not so feasible, maybe we need to wait on them. But overall, we decided on a group of things that we wanted to do. Now, a couple of months later, skip down the road, we're about to, to launch the redesigned website for the theater, the new experience, and if we're looking at all the changes that were a part of that redesign, like, it was only, wait for it, wait for it, wait. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> Hold on. Sorry. Uh, here, maybe I'll just use the, the keyboard. Ah, oh, okay, this is it, this is it, this is good. Okay, so, this little blue circle is what we actually did, right? Like, so we had a ton of stuff right here that we agreed on that were things that we wanted to do, right? Things that the client said, yes, like these are things that we need to do. Everything from like, changing the, the way that the image style rendered on the page to completely new navigation categories. But only a fraction of those actually got done. And the fraction was important because those were missed opportunities. And we didn't implement things that could have increased donations, that could have been an interactive portal for teachers all the people that we talked to, all of our learnings, I mean, sure, we did some really useful stuff, right? But there were missed opportunities. There was stuff that just didn't happen. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, is, is how to seize these missed opportunities, how to get inside that piece of the pie and do user research that really moves the needle. Now, like you might be thinking, like, John, you had a really good, like, like you had a budget, you had the time to do user research. You got to talk to all those groups of people. 
we don't even get to do that. Like, our, you know, we don't have the money. We, we just simply don't have the infrastructure. And, and I hear these things, and, and I felt these things. And that was a really good case, right? That was almost as good as it gets of, of having the resources to be able to do user research. So I've heard a couple of things. It's expensive, right? Either time or, or money, right? Whether you're in-house doing research or whether you're in, at, at an agency, budgets get squeezed. Or maybe you don't have usability testing labs. Maybe you don't have someone who's on your team who's like a researcher. How many of you guys are researchers? Like you have, that's like in your title. Just a couple, okay. And, and how many of you guys are designers? Okay, so a couple more. Good, good. This talk is for you. This talk is for all of you. So what else have we heard? That it's unnecessary. At Google, we like to throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks. You, you might have noticed some of the products that we've rolled out, we have to you know, sunset and um, kind of like take off the market. And I don't think that's necessarily the greatest thing. Um, but, and I think that sometimes when this happens, it's rolled up into this attitude of, we don't have time for this, we just need to get something out and see how the public reacts to it, see what our users think about it. Right? It's just, research is just unnecessary in our process because we're gonna get that data in beta. Sometimes that's, that's what I've heard. What about another reason? User research, well, it's limiting. And, and it sounds like a, a lot of you guys are, are designers in this room. And, and I'm sure you have that feeling, or at least you've heard others say that, well, I don't wanna be data driven, right? Like, I don't wanna test 40 shades of blue and have to make a decision about what to do just on that data. I want creative authority. I wanna be able to make decisions that aren't necessarily like, just derived from user data. Okay, so those are three things that we talked about. We talked about expensive, being unnecessary, and being limited. And these are the things that, that I wanna address. So I, I wanna introduce you guys to, to two main areas. One are methods. And I wanna, I wanna go over some things that I think that you'll find helpful some things that you can do starting right now, tools that you can use that would be awesome. But it's also how these tools come together. It's more than just saying, hey, go out and use this website. Or hey, like, do usability testing like this. I think it's, it's more about the process by which you combine these things. It's like baking, right? Like you have the raw ingredients, you have the eggs, the flour, the butter. But unless you have a recipe, you know, you might get into a food fight, right? You might use things not in the most effective way possible. So that's what I wanna talk about too. I wanna to talk about how methods come together. And I think in order to, to be able to do this, there's three different areas that we need to rethink as designers, as researchers, as UX professionals. We need to dig into and deconstruct a little bit. Okay, so those three, three main areas. Um, and, and you can call these, like, think about these as like myths of UX. So things that aren't necessarily true. Conceptions that if you want to be lean and efficient, you got to rethink these. Research is, is just a few people's jobs. Just one or two people are like, you know, like an agency's job. We're paid to ship, meaning like we're paid to launch products, features. And then build first, then research. So th these are all things that I want us to rethink in this conversation. I'm glad I'm not falling yeah, over, over, over the court. If I fall down, I'll get right back up. I'm trying to do the keyboard and then do the mic. Do a little dance here. Okay, let's start with the first one. Research is just a few people's jobs. So I think that there's this notion of research is being really important. Like this job that is done by people in white lab coats with whatever you know, syringe deals. And you think about that, and that, that is like a kind of research, scientific research, right? But we're talking much more applied, right? User experience research is not this. But because there's this notion of research being kind of lofty, we ask this question, 
when we're planning projects, or when we're in a project, about, okay, who can do the research on our team? Or what agency do we have that can do this for us? And I think that's the wrong question. I think the right question is, who cares about your users? And it's really everybody in your organization. Everybody where you work should care about your users or your clients' users, from the front desk staff to the CEO. Because if those users aren't happy, then you don't have a job. Your role isn't there. So under this context, the focus changes. Well, not just who can do it, because I think a lot of people have the ability to participate and do user research. And also, there's an important point here. So like the 25 pages of analysis that we put together for the, the theater uh, client engagement, also it like, kind of slows you down, right? When you have, like, it's, there's a lot of great stuff here, but it took our clients and it took our team a lot of time to read through this stuff, you know? Like, it might be great, but it's still that transmission of information takes a while. And when research is not just one person's job, or like a few people's job, but it's the product team's job, you share information. And you, not only information, but you share an understanding of your users, right? So it's less about one person putting together 25 pages of reports or a presentation, and it's more about your entire team increasing their, their understanding. When you have that, you have efficiency, right? You have speed. So what do I mean by product team? A product team could be like really broad, or it could be very small. At Google and, and on my team, this is how we, how we think about it, more or less. The people that are closest to like the code. In, in our situation, it's developers, engineers, designers, researchers, product managers, writers. Um, and then kind of one step removed from that would be like customer service people, sales, executives. Those folks are still stakeholders, but when I'm talking about the product team, I mean the people that are like in their day-to-day -day making decisions about the product and about the feature. This could be different for you, and it, it, it probably is. But keep in your mind who that group is for you as I'm going through these points. Okay, so like what are the jobs of the research? And if, if you are a researcher, then you might be more familiar with these. If you're not, then maybe you've been a part of them, maybe you've been on the periphery a little bit, but you know, it's, it's pretty basic stuff. You plan, you execute, like moderate like a usability inter like a usability test or an interview, um, and then you analyze everything, and by evangelize, I mean like, distribute the results, share what you found to the stakeholders, stuff like that. This is traditionally how I think most teams do it. Where like there's a researcher who does all these activities, and plans it out, yeah, like gets input from people, but I think that there's a difference between getting input and having the team actually perform these roles. Right? Like actually like write the plan or write the, the moderation guide and, and those kinds of things. So this is what traditionally happens. But what I'm advocating for is where you take that product team and you put them in roles that are typically done by one researcher or a team of researchers. And we'll talk more about like ways that you can actually do this and like, tools that are really good to do this. But again, like why? Why is this important? It's because you're increasing understanding. You're minimizing deliverables because you're getting everyone on the same page because, because it's it's not just your research, it's the whole team's research, right? Like there's more buy-in, there's more ownership if you decentralize this role that's traditionally been just one person, one group of people. So I want to um, share an example. And uh, it's one that's kind of something that I'm going through right now, well, a personal one. And I'll bring it up several times in the presentation. But I, I think it's kind of an interesting one. Maybe we can apply some of this stuff to it. Hey, there I am. Uh, and there's my six week old baby. He can never pose in a family photo, like smiling. So I'm like, screw it. 
Do you want to cry? I'll cry. And, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm actually very happy, but uh, just doesn't like it right here. So um, as a new family, I have lots of, lots of questions. I, I know very, very little about childcare, or, or I did before I had our baby. So my wife and I have been going to this place called Natural Resources, which is a shop. And they have classes in the back of the shop and stuff like, um, you know, how to nurse your baby, how to, like, what diaper rash looks like, understanding poop colors, which is, like, a big deal for babies. Like, if you haven't had a baby, like, understanding poo is, like, an entire, like, day-long class. It's, it's amazing. Okay, so we learn about these things, right? And, like, we discuss in, in groups of other parents and people in similar situations as us. So the classes are great. I've been learning a lot, but the, the online resources and their technological proficiency is god awful. <laughs> so I'm sitting here in these classes, and like one side of my brain is like taking information about okay, what do I need to, to learn to be a good father, to be a good parent? And then on the other side of my brain, I'm like, how can I improve their UX? What can I do? Oh my God, John, like help the world, help them, you know, help other parents. So, so I'm like, okay, screw it. Like I'm putting together this presentation. Why don't I use that as a use case? Why don't I say like, well, what could they do better in a lean research way? So that's what we should look at right now. So one of the questions that, that was occurring for me when I was in these sessions is like, you know, once we're done with the class, like there's a whole, like there's nothing that happens after. So there's a whole community of like parents sharing tips, but natural resources, this group, doesn't do anything with it. There's no mobile app, their site isn't really good. There's no way to connect people after that class. So I was like, well, how can we do that? Like, how can we connect people and, and members like myself to like share more and learn from each other? So like one of the, a method that I think works really well is Looking at prototypes. I'm sure many, most of you have done this before, developed a prototype, and then tested it. You know, usability testing, and user interviews. But I think that there's a step before that, a method that, that's worked really well for us, and could work well for natural resources. Your, your competitors are the best prototypes that you could start off with. Like if you're just, if you have an early idea, maybe if you're just, iterating on features that have already been created, using your competitors is a, is a great way to find out what works about the design patterns, about the, the design language, the interactions, the terminology that, that you might want to include. And these don't have to be direct competitors, maybe they're indirect. But in the case of natural resources, there's a ton of competitors. Like if you go to the App Store, you go to the Play Store, there's this one called like Smile Moms, which is an online sharing platform. Mothers and fathers sharing like how it works. Whoa, okay, that's really close to what I think natural resources should be doing with their product. So looking at your experience, like what you would want to do, um, and comparing it to what your competitors do, and treating them as prototypes in the same way that you would treat your own prototype if you developed one out, is a really great activity and a great starting place for being lean in your, in your research approach. So, whereas before, if you had one researcher, maybe their job would be to, okay, here's the task we're going to go over, here's um, how we want to look at this competitor. But what I'm advocating for is that you bring other people in that process. You as designers are that process. You can do this right now. You don't need to be a researcher to look at your competitors. And, and I think that you're probably already doing this. I think that you're probably already doing due diligence about products that exist out there. But the next step is putting users in front of your competitors and assessing their reactions and assessing how well they can complete tasks. So in the case of natural resources, maybe the task is like, um, find out what healthy poop looks like. Yeah. You know? baby poo. Maybe that's a task that you have people go through and you can find out on a graph. Okay, here's how I ask a mom that question and here's a photo that I upload. And you'll learn really interesting things. 
Um, and okay, so one way to do this that I think is it's really quick, we've had a lot of success with, is this website usertesting.com. Have any of you guys used that? Usertesting.com? Okay, yeah, maybe like a couple people. So basically you, you fill out uh, like screening criteria, like people that you want to interview, or not interview, but like go through these tasks. Your, the competitor task or for your own prototypes. You can basically point people to whatever you want. It could be a website, prototype, mobile app, any of those things. And choose who you want. So in the case of natural resources, it'd be like parents, young parents, uh, maybe just moms, so you know, just females or whatever, whoever you choose. And then what they do is they have a pool that they recruit from. So screener goes out, just the people you want and they go through the users, so the, your, your potential users go through these tasks, and what you get is a video at the end. And it depends on what your tasks are, maybe you can ask them some questions, they can respond, you see where they click or where they tap, could be a mobile app that, you, that you're looking at. This is really great information, it's great qualitative information, and it comes in in an hour, pretty much, more or less, depending on who you're looking at. Longest I've seen is like a day or two days. So you get information really quickly. And, and you can involve your whole team. Like at the start, and then also at the end as well. So imagine at the beginning of the day, you assess, okay, who are my competitors? What's, what are the tasks that we want users to accomplish? Let's have users try those tasks on a competitor platform and then you'll get videos back at the end of the day that you all watch together. And analysis can be as simple as on a whiteboard in the same room that you're watching the videos where you're making notes about highlights, lowlights, what works, what doesn't. And it's, it's pretty cheap, right? Like under, just under 50 US dollars per participant video. And the videos are like 50, can be like 15 minutes each or so. Um, and then as I mentioned before, it's super quick. So this is just one website, just one tool that I've had success with. I'm sure that there's others like this that you can use, but I think it's a great way to start that, that thinking as researchers, not just researchers. You as designers need and want to be close to your users. That's why you are a designer. Right? You care about the end user. You care about that experience. And this is a great way for you to be able to start right now without any, like, centralized research person or agency doing this for you. So another quick example, meetup.com is a website, a mobile app, that allows people to meet up in person, broad variety of interests from like cycling, hiking, running, walking, or you know, parenting groups, all kinds of stuff, just bringing people together in person. And they set a goal to like really refine their process of how they talk to users, and they said, we're gonna bring people in once a week, we're gonna bring three people in once a week uh, before noon on Thursday. Every week, we're gonna have users here in our office getting data, which is pretty amazing. Like if you can get user feedback every week, that's, that's pretty amazing. Um, I think a model where it's not just one person doing the recruiting, the uh, planning the research, but it's your team, it's used designers, it's used product managers, in that together, you're able to do what Meetup did. And that's exactly how they got this done. But not only that, here's where things get really interesting. So, you know, once a week, I think we can do better. Better than like getting users into your office once a week? Yeah, like every day, well almost, four times a week. They ramped up to four times a week that they're bringing like three to five people into the office to get feedback. And they're pulling users from their community Meetup.com has a lot of forums, obviously, like where people are talking, so they're drawing from that participant pool. But what I think is, is amazing is how much this cost, $30,000, is generally what like a large-scale usability test outsource costs, more or less. And how they're able to get this done is like using a team, not just one person, but a, a product team approach where the product manager was asking questions on the fly during user interviews. As people came in, he or she was typing messages to the moderator, who wasn't necessarily a researcher. The moderator was a designer one week, or the writer the next week. It's just someone who is in front of a user asking questions that the whole team is putting together. It was very fast, much faster 
than just say one person doing this alone. And back to that, those deliverables, that, that 25 page document, like there is no 25 page document when you're moving this fast, but they're able to innovate and get rid of that deliverable, but just innovate based on their findings. That are like all the data that's coming in is just immense. Now, this doesn't mean that like research should go away. Like, I still care about my day job. I'm not talking myself out of a job. I'm a researcher, right? John, what are you doing? Come on, man, shut up. All the researchers in the room are saying. Um, there's still like details to, many details that are important. Like, eliminating bias, I think is a really, really important one for researchers. Like, you know, making sure that you're asking questions in a way that aren't leading. Like, how much do you like our website? Do you like it a lot, or do you like it like a really, really, really a lot? Like that's a leading question, right? There, there's bias in that question. Of course, there's many, most forms are more subtle than that. Um, but there's a, a variety of things about getting reliable data that are important for people who are trained in unique methods, research methods, to be able to do for you. Um, but it doesn't mean that the person who's handling this stuff has to handle all the other stuff. Because you want that shared understanding that shared understanding with the product team. So again, if you want to be lean, if you want to be efficient and share understanding, it's removing from just a few people's jobs to the product team's job. User research is something you can all do right now. Okay, let's look at the, the second model to rethink. We're paid to ship, and we're paid to like launch products. You guys have probably heard something similar to this that we're not in it for art, right? Like these are business decisions that we're making. We're driving business goals. We're not just designing for the sake of designing. And I think we know that. But oftentimes, we have, well, first our goal is that we have an idea, we have a feature, and we ship that feature, and we intend for it to do something in the world. Right, for in the natural resources example, we intend to connect parents with each other. We intend for them to share information, and the idea is a mobile app. It's a mobile app to be able to do that. But often what happens is that we, we don't quite meet the outcome that we were thinking that we would. So you can imagine here that this line represents a whole lot of research that might be going into the product, like little usability sessions, like iterating. I'm not saying that like, this isn't like iterating and refining the, the product, but I think that you know, there's a difference between executing and executing on the right thing. Bill Buck Buxton had a great quote. We wanna get the design right, and, and we wanna get the right design. Right? Meaning, and those are two different things. One's evaluating and iterating what you're building, and then the other thing we want to do is make sure that we're building the right damn thing, right? And oftentimes, I think we get locked in these cycles of iterating on where we think we're going, but that's not necessarily where we are going. So what we want to move to is a model where we're experimenting based on outcomes. Not just on like what the feature can do, like the usability of a feature, but experimenting on is this delivering what I intend it to deliver? Is, is the feature that I'm building producing the outcome that I expect to see in the world? For instance, in the natural resources example, it's like is this product so far, as we built it so far, or maybe before that, actually going to be able to connect mothers? Okay, so here's what I want to say. Paid to ship, like meaning like we're paid to develop features and launch them into the world. If you want to be lean, if you want to be efficient in how you're collecting user research, then we need to think about we're paid to experiment. We're paid to design and research experiments. Now I'll talk about what, what exactly this means. There's a, there's a structure that I think that would be helpful here for you guys to kind of understand um, some of these points. I'm calling it BOSAM. These are just acronyms. I'll see what these acronyms mean. But I think it's helpful as just as a structure to be able to design experiments. 
that are based on an outcome versus not just features. So features and outcomes are, are part of this model, the focus and end model. And I'll talk about what each of these is. So features like what do you intend to build? Now outcome and signal are tied together. What will happen when you ship? Signal is like, how do you know that that's actually happening? It could be quantitative data, qualitative data, market reaction, satisfaction. How do you know that the outcome has been reached? And, and this might seem like the same thing, like outcome, signal, seems like kind of related, but not necessarily, right? And often they're not. If you want to do something like increase user engagement, when have people jump into that, be happy and satisfied and all those things, like how do you determine if they are, if that is in fact the case? Is retention one of those things? Are users coming back to your app? Are they reacting to notifications? Maybe that's increase and increase of engagement. Are they, are they enabling notifications? Maybe that's an increase of engagement. There's lots of signals that could reflect an outcome, right? So, Focusing on outcomes and signals is, is part of this model. And then the last part, assets and method. Now notice here that I'm not saying designs. I'm not saying that you're researching designs necessarily. Assets could be a broad variety of things. Could be just content. Could be just words that you're looking at. Whatever helps to validate that signal and that outcome is important. And then the method is like how you go about that. Okay, let's make this real. Let's look at natural resources again as, as a model. Let's say that natural resources did want to build a new app, mobile app. Okay, so that's the feature, the entire app. Now we want to think, what's the outcome and what are the signals? Like, What is that app intended to do? What happens when it actually ships? Well, like the goal for natural resources is to increase membership rates, to get people in the door using their products. Okay, what's a signal that this is happening? Well, there's plenty of signals I'm sure they can measure. They can measure visitor traffic, they can measure class enrollments, but like for this app, for this feature, like the mobile app, like how do they know that the, that the outcome's going to be effective? Well, a great signal would be that like potential members, people who aren't using their services, are at least interested in something like this, like an online community, right? Like that's validation of the outcome right now. Before you even, before they even started building anything, those are some outcomes and signals they could look at, or an outcome and signal. So how do you do this? Like, how could they? How can you assess? Do does our potential audience actually want this or not? Well, assets that you could use are survey questions, and use Google Consumer Surveys to launch a survey. One of the one of the reasons I'm talking about Google Consumer Surveys isn't just because I'm from Google but because it's actually a great tool and it's so cheap. It, have you guys heard of Google Consumer Surveys before? Yes, just a couple people. Um, it's like a survey wall. If you visited um, websites like this, like the Daily Tribune, and you see an article up there, and users see uh, one question or a series of questions that they answer before getting to that content. So it's a way for um, publishers to put, not ads, but survey questions that you can release to them, right? So it's very quick for users and rates of response are, are really good on these. So it allows you to get data really quickly. But what, it, what does this look like for natural resources? So you go to consumer surveys and you fill out who you want to reach, who you care about. And natural resources, their potential users are like here I just filled out you know broad range of people, Android smartphone users, and then I and it's gonna be kind of hard to see what comes next, but I'll just tell you what I, I actually went through when I and I did this survey because I was kind of interested in it. I was like, would potential natural resource members be interested in an online community? So I actually went through and filled this out and, and did a survey. Um, and so I asked, my first question was, are you a new parent? Like, do you have a child age zero through two, or are you pregnant right now? So I kind of screened out people, looking at like, and you could do this with your products, like who exactly do we want to reach? And then I asked the question, and you guys can't see this, but I asked this question. Um, what's the most important for you? Most important for you as a new parent? Learning from other parents, 
discounts on child-related items. There's a couple of other, other things in there. Um, but the most, like the one that I was like curious about, the one that I really wanted to see if we could move the needle on was learning from other parents online, right? That's a signal for how well this mobile app is going to be received, even before we started building anything. So, what we found was that people love discounts. <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> discounts on child-related items. 43% of people said that that was most important to them as a new parent. Now what's interesting is that the one I was expecting, like, okay, an online community for parents to share, to get to know each other, uh, it wasn't number two, it wasn't number three, it was number four, with about 10, only 10% 10 of people saying that that was the most important thing to them. And you can see these, these bars right here represent statistical significance. There's like a lot of modeling that goes in behind that, but it's just a way to say that if we were to run this again, we'd, we'd probably get these results, and these results are statistically significant. Uh, and there's more questions that you can ask here. Like, it probably raises questions for you. Well, like, you know, do we do care about parents that, that young? Like, do, you know, can we alter this a little bit? And those are great questions to have. But this is guiding even before we built the app, right? This is looking at the signals that are going to reflect, well, what is this, are we gonna get to the outcome that we want? And I would argue that if I was building the app for natural resources, that we do things like include more expert advice or like make that one of our primary features. That we make meetups in person really important in the feature that we're building. Okay, and so again, Google Consumer Surveys, you get a lot of responses in a very quick amount of time um, and it doesn't cost that much. I mean, this is like 250 US dollars compared to like Surveys of this scale cost thousands of dollars more than this. So we're paid to ship, we're paid to experiment, right? To design experiments that get at what are the right signals and what are the right outcomes that we're building towards. Okay, last section, build first, then research. There's an interesting um, story of color, which is an application that was designed to bring people together around photo streams that were sharing photos in the same place. There's an interesting rise and fall of the app called Color. It looks some, something like this. It was released in 2011. There was a lot of fanfare. They raised $40 million before they launched. So there was a lot of hype, like the idea was you know, people were really excited about this idea. They launched, and then a year later, they were done. Not sold, not acquired, not transformed into something else that was beautiful, they were done. And part of the reason why is because there was a fundamental difficulty with their execution. The idea was great. In fact, the idea itself is something that many other apps are doing. Even iPhone photos has like a photo stream, right? Like these notions of sharing photos by proximity and by the people that you care about, of course, that's, that idea is golden. But how they executed it was not right. Um, when you weren't around other people, there was nothing to do on the application itself. Like, so if you're taking, like when you open it up and there's no one else around, there's nothing to do. So they were, they were executing towards an outcome but they, they just studied the product way too late. If they had gotten this in some form in front of users before they had actually started to build, the founder would have gotten to this quote a lot sooner. And this is at the end of their product development phase, right? Like, oh my God. So focusing on the, the outcomes and the signals, we mentioned this in the last section, is really important to do to avoid the, the demise of apps like color. So build first, then research. Define your signals first. So thinking about like one piece of this, as we mentioned in the last section, is designing experiments. You're not just designing features. You're designing potential outcomes. And to get to those outcomes, you can de define the signals. You can, you can innovate how you think about like, 
well, what will tell us that this outcome is being achieved? So let's just say the natural resources example again. Okay, a rich sharing app, the feature is a you know, rich sharing app. The outcome, make sure that members are, are connected to each other. And then a signal here might be like 20 cent of 20% of current members sign up for that. Well, how do you know this if you don't build it? Right? Like, how do you find out that people are going to sign up for the app if you don't have a working prototype or you don't have something in beta? Well, there's a really good way to. And it's, well, the first step is like writing exactly what you think this thing is going to do. So, like, create a description in the same way as if you were publishing to the App Store or the Play Store. So that, and you don't have to like have screenshots and all that. You could. But just like think about that description and value propositions. And then, Use what I call a teaser. Like on the natural resources site, there's places like classes and places like blog that their current members are going right now. And you could put something like a sign up form. Now, granted, your app isn't created yet, right? This is designing the signal first before you actually design the designs. And you, if, you're, if the signal that you're thinking is, is right, it's like, well, 20% of the people that hit this page are actually going to sign up for the app, then it tells you something. If no one expresses interest, then it tells you something as well. Maybe this isn't the right place to put this, but you can innovate on that. You can put it in a couple different places. And by this, I mean a sign up form that says, hey, we're building this app, be the first to know about it. They could also hand out flyers in their classes and say, hey, we're building this app, go to this link, if you want to hear more about it, and then they can measure traffic. Right? That's a way to, to validate whether, whether their assumptions are right, whether they're building the right thing and not just getting the design right. Okay, well you might say, okay, John, well, like, I'm not building an entire new mobile app, and my, my idea is more immersive. It has to be experienced like a double rainbow. Oh my god, double rainbow. You know, it's like, just more immersive. There's a couple, there's three other ways that, that I want to talk about that are good to do before you build, research methods before you build to validate your assumptions. One, like Dropbox. Before they launched, they had a demo video that explained what Dropbox was. Now, today we all know what it was, but back then, a couple of years ago, people weren't so sure about the idea. They released it on Hacker News. And, they're, and they didn't have the product up and running, they weren't testing it yet, this was just a demo video of what they wanted to put out later. Their, their um, email interest list went from about 5,000 to 75,000 after they released this demo. The founder said, we got feedback that was equivalent to if we had actually put this into people's hands. Because people had questions about it, oh, well how does this work with security and privacy and um, can this plug and play with like files that, I do you know, use through these other ways. So they, they, they um, got these questions from users, they got feedback, and they validated their assumption that this is actually going to be useful in the market, that people are going to, to want this. A Wizard of Oz approach is the one that Zappos used. Their founder, uh, Wizard of Oz means kind of like, like doing stuff behind the scenes, like the website is working but it's actually just a person, like a little hamster on a wheel, just running away, it's not a database. Zappos founder went, like he didn't have a, he had a website, but he was going from shop to shop, taking photos of shoes, and then putting those on the site, and then when someone made an order, he would go back to the store, buy the shoes, and then send them. <laughs> so there wasn't like a database, there wasn't like customer relationship management, he literally just was doing all this himself. Why did he do that? Well, it was a signal. If he put the website up, if people thought that this kind of immersive experience with high quality photos and great customer service was, was a great thing, then people would buy shoes, and they did. Okay, um, confident, I wanna talk about that one. Okay, so define signals, then research. So we talked about a lot of things. We talked about the FOSAM model, right? Features, outcomes, signals, assets. Using user testing, competitors' prototypes, surveys, teasers, what you can do actually before you build products. So just wanted to um, talk a little bit about those things that we mentioned before at the very beginning, right? Like research is limiting. If you use these methods, if you break apart 
the researcher's role, it becomes liberating. You have a shared understanding amongst the team and not just one person delivering insights. Right? You're, you're open to interpret the data because the team is all familiar with the data and act on it accordingly. You move from costly to inexpensive because you're doing just enough. You're doing just enough to experiment with whether you think that outcome is, is going to be achieved or not in the same way that you did surveys, right? Doing just enough. You're designing experiments and not end features. And then unnecessary, well, we'll find out when we launch. Well, in this case, you can find out now. You can do a demo video. You can do a website sign up. You can do the Wizard of Oz model. You don't have to build first. This is an essential piece of the pie to determine whether you're getting the, the design right and the right design. Why are we doing all this? Well, in the end, it's great to have efficient research. It's great to be able to tell whether your products are working. But in the end, it's for our users, right? And the better you're able to get close to them, the more that your products will speak to them. So that's all I have. I wanted to save some time for questions. Do we have any time for questions? Uh, yeah, of course, we can take like um, five minutes for questions. Five whole minutes for questions I went over. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to give you guys more time. Um, yeah, so do you guys have any questions? Please raise your hand if you have any questions, and I will get back to the mic. Yes, I really like your presentation. I, I agree with everything you said as a researcher. Uh, my main question is coming from Google, which is at least I think it is like that, um, engineer driving company. How is it to have this conversation with your colleagues and to have people actually doing this kind of, of thing? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I mentioned before the testing 40 shades of blue. The, um, some of you might be familiar with this example. It's where a designer left Google because they're like, I can't take it anymore because we're just like, making choices based completely on data. Uh, I think at Google, we've moved very far away from that. Um, part of it has been like a cultural shift um, in us expressing why design matters. Um, and I think part of expressing like why design-driven design, design-driven right? design uh, production process matters. Um, and part of uh, the way that you can kind of show, part of the way to do that is by showing success. Um, and when we've implemented some of these methods, uh, particularly like, like one like A-B testing, where you're testing different versions of a, a website, that one I found is a way, one that engineers really gravitate towards because it's, it's, in a, um, it's dealing with the code, it's dealing with what's live on the site, and it's quantitative, but it also opens up qualitative questions. Right? If, you, if one experiment, if version B measures better than version A, raises these questions of like, well, we know what happened, but why? And that's where a lot of our, our developers and our engineers say, well, I could really use some insights here if I'm gonna build what's next and you're gonna design what's next, I wanna know why. But a place to start is like by asking, we were asking them, hey, could you help with this A-B test? Um, and I'm sure you can find some others that are like quantitative, but they can inform a lot of qualitative decisions. Yeah. Hey. Hi, John. Hey. hey. Thank you for your, your it was really interesting. Well, um, my question is about, I think that the goal of involving uh, a lot of people in your mm -hmm. team and develop them as researchers is very interesting and it's like a, a goal, to be, yeah. a, a, it, it's a, a goal aim, but my question is how, first we have to interest people in UX, mm -hmm. And then we have to make, I don't know, just the minimal education. You, you said something like, you, you don't want them to bias mm -hmm. the users in, in interviews or tests. So, mm -hmm. And some, sometimes there are some uh, interest in conflict. Mm -hmm. And not everybody, I don't know, it's made that journey that means for, for a researcher or yeah. a US visitor to, to step behind and, yep. and leave the user to to talk. So I, I wanted to ask you about some strategies to, to deal with this. Yeah, uh, I, 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 that's, that's a great question. Um, 
and I, I think there's oftentimes there's people who have no experience with UX. Uh, well, there's kind of different, I found different categorizations, like people without the experience, but with the interest, people without the experience with the capabilities, but not necessarily the interest, um, and then folks who are just like doing their thing, like I'm developing, I don't like, I do back-end code, that's what I do. And, and I think applying, um, one really important method that, that I've applied that's been helpful is uh, targeting empathy towards my coworkers. So like, you know how like, we have empathy for users? Like we try to understand users' mental models. I've been trying to do the same thing with my coworkers. <laughs> yeah. And I've been trying to ask, what keeps you up at night? What do you, what do you have to do to get promoted? Um, and then like, I don't know, just generally kind of like what, what interests you, right? And, um, and like, even if I'm not asking them that question, I generally don't ask my colleagues, hey, what do you have to do to get promoted? <laughs> but, but I kind of have a, like, asking myself that question, I have a sense of like, oh, well, you need to write damn good code, you need to ship really quickly, you need to, cl to collaborate well. And then I can, I can use that information and say like, well, this person has never been like, interested in UX, they don't have a lot of skills, but because I have empathy for them and I, I kind of am, understand their role, then maybe I can find ways to get them involved with some of this. I think the usertesting.com example is really interesting because you could do that today. You could set up a user test, it's very inexpensive, and get qualitative like, you know, videos back um, and you could simply pose to the people that have never been interested in UX before. It's like, hey, I have a problem. Um, I think you would be good in helping to solve it. I want to ask users something. Would you mind like taking a look at these questions or helping me with these questions? Come back later in the day and be like, oh, here's here's a video of the questions that you helped me with. Stuff like that. Like finding like small ways to get them involved and understanding where their interests are. It's something I found helpful. Yeah. Thanks. Cool, awesome. We have time for one more question. Hey. <laughs> okay, here. Hey. <laughs> hey, uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, so uh, I just want to share uh, my experience about that. Awesome. Yeah, now in my company we are we are having a transition because uh, we have uh, like a NBA a researchers team there, but uh, the schedule is very low. I don't know if they go for a long time. Like, uh, you want to do research, they, they go around the world to, to uh, talk to users. But we have a product that we need uh, like two or three weeks to validate. So uh, now you're trying to, to convince the directors, the board, uh, that we need this. But uh, I don't know if I'm wrong, but uh, about the, the UX researchers, uh, they, they want to do something uh, with uh, very good quality and they don't want to spend uh, like uh, one week on that. They want to do the best as, as possible. So uh, I don't know if in Google you did that, but uh, do, did you have this experience too? I don't know, I have a, 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 quantity, a, a quality or quantity yeah. data, yeah. What, but you have uh, this format of a yeah. quick uh, uh, research. Right, right. Yeah, so, um, so one, like my experiences at Google are, uh, Google is really abnormal. <laughs> like in terms of like the resources that we have to do research, like we do some, some crazy shit. Like it takes time, lots of money, it's great, I love it, it's experimental. But it's not this, right? And, and a lot of people, most people, before I came to Google, I was like, I could barely have money to do like usability testing, much less go around the world and like interview people. Um, so that, that I think is, is one thing to keep in mind if you hear things like, oh, well, Google does this and that. Um, yeah, we do like a lot of stuff, but I think that there's ways to be lean. Um, there's also uh, a phrase that as, as a consultant and in the agency, like I would always keep in the back of my head. You can have, like when I was talking to clients, I would think you, know, you, can, you can have it good, you can have it cheap, and you can have it fast pick two of those, because you can't have all three, right? Like you gotta choose good, cheap, fast. Um, and so I think part of that, like by good, uh, you can have all three in fact, if you narrow your scope to just the right thing. 
if you're saying we really want quality research, we need to know about users, but we need to do it in a week, you're not gonna learn about like international uh, habits of people on mobile, right? That's a huge question to, to isolate in a week. Tablet usage, phone usage, versus desktop, versus you know contextual use, like all that stuff, that's a huge research question. Maybe you could look at, um, you know, how do people like organize their apps on their phone? How do people in Africa or Nigeria organize apps on their phone, right? Like that's a much smaller question. And I don't know, you know if that's a good research question or not, it probably isn't, like who cares? But like you see my point about like narrowing the scope, you, it speeds things up, essentially. Like, but th there's no easy solution to the like, we want to answer really broad questions and we want to do it like really fast. I think in this model, it's like starting off with experiments and segmenting the work. You're like we care about this question for the first week sprint, then we care about this question for the next week and this question for the next week. Because of our product cycle, uh, we, we, we launch our product globally, but yeah. we, we don't have time for like uh, 20, 30 applications or something in one year. So uh, we need we need to to uh, choose uh, this strategy, but using the same scope. We need the good, but we need fast. And let's let's talk after. <laughs> okay. Okay, John Douglas, everyone, let's give. Thanks, a guys.